Chapter 19, Liver Function. You have a great graphic in your textbook, and as we cover the next information, just watch your graphic here. Your blood is going to come from your portal vein and hepatic artery and flow through the sinuoids in the liver. And you can see your arrows of the blood flow over to the central vein. While they're in this area of the liver, they go through a major cleaning of the blood. We're going to remove waste products, debris, bacteria, toxins, things that are in the blood that we need to get rid of. The hepatocytes are cells that line these chambers and they are pulling out these elements along with Kupfer cells that do the phagocytosis and they dump this debris into bile ducts or actually bile caniculus which go back to the bile duct and then this is dispensed into the GI tract for elimination. So the liver has major functions of metabolism, excretion, detoxification, storage, and immunological. And we've been learning along the way other things that the liver functions. In metabolism, they are the major processor for carbohydrates. They produce this endogenous cholesterol that we need, so we don't have to have so much ingestion of it. They synthesize proteins, and they synthesize these lipoproteins. They excrete by sending this waste to the gallbladder, and the bile acids then are discarded or somehow utilized for other use. Particularly in the liver, we're concerned about bilirubin. Detoxification, there again, bilirubin, alcohol, drugs, anything that we enter into our system is going to go to the liver. So we do great disservice to our liver when we engulf large amounts of toxic substances. As far as storage, iron is used in recycling from your hemoglobin, so it helps recycle those iron particles and along with the fat-soluble vitamins and glycogen. The immunological function involves the Kupfer cells that are going to engulf your bacteria and other substances. It's going to secrete IgA. Concerning bilirubin metabolism, we know bilirubin comes from the hemoglobin that's released from our old red cells. There is approximately 200 to 400 milligrams of bilirubin released and 80% is from this hemoglobin. 90% of the unconjugated bilirubin circulates in the bloodstream bound to albumin. It's going to get a little confusing with our terms for bilirubin. This is a good picture showing you the liver and how that hemoglobin has come from the red cells into the liver and now part of it is going to be dumped through the bile duct into the stool. This is what gives our color to the stool and part of it is going to go through the renal system and be excreted as urobilinogen. During bilirubin metabolism Thinking back on hemoglobin, we had porphyrin ring and is converted to biliverdin, 
which is a green colored cast. And if you think about bile, you think green. Billy Verdon reductase reduces the Billy Verdon into indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. When the bilirubin goes to the liver, the albumin is removed. That's what it's bound with. That's what it's carried, hemoglobin. And um, an enzyme of glucuronic acid molecules binds to this bilirubin. And this is called conjugated bilirubin. Conjugated direct, or the terminology is direct, was old because it was directly measured as opposed to indirect because it was calculated. But the current terms are conjugated. So the bilirubin becomes bound, conjugated, with these glucuronic acid molecules, making it water-soluble so it can cross cell membranes. Then it is excreted into this bioconicula in the liver and stored in the gallbladder until the GI system says, hey, I'm eating, and we expel some bile through the, the bile duct into the large intestine. Bacteria in the large intestine then help break down bilirubin to urobilinogen, which is oxidized to your urobilinin, and that gives you the color to your stool. Here is a graphic to help you understand what we just discussed. The heme from your hemoglobin is converted to biliverdin. This is making it unconjugated, binds to albumin in the blood, and gets to the liver. So here is the blood, and here is the liver. In the liver, the hepatocytes then remove it from the albumin and conjugate it with the glucuronic acid, which then is sent to the bile duct for elimination in the unconjugated form. So it changes quite a bit through this cycle. And this graphic is showing you about the same thing as some of our other pictures. It's got a little more information. So we have red cell destruction, catabolism, and a little bit from our bone marrow to come up with our bilirubin, but the majority of it from the red cells. And it is on albumin, but we call it unconjugated. Don't think of free and bound with some of our other elements and their protein. Unconjugated as far as the glucuronic acids and in the liver is where it becomes conjugated so that it can cross the membranes to get where it needs to go and then convert it back in the intestine. When we measure bilirubin, we often measure a total and a direct or conjugated. And this was a direct measurement. That's where it got its name. It's a water-soluble form. It came from the bile for elimination, and then it's reduced to your bilinogen. A small portion is reabsorbed back to the liver. Indirectly, which would be your total minus your conjugated, gives you what's not conjugated. And this is water insoluble, so we're not finding it in the blood. Unconjugated is bound to the albumin. So let's think free is unbound to cross the membranes. That's significant because in our newborns, they are undergoing major changes at birth. A lot of red cells are dying and being absorbed this way. And so they have an excessive amount of this unbound bilirubin that can cross the cell membranes and they like to go to the brain and when they settle in the brain it's called conicterus. It will cause brain damage so we need to get rid of it. The liver isn't mature enough to absorb all of it so 
the best way is to put the baby in the sunlight and that helps break it down and eliminate it and anybody that you've seen that's having some bilirubin issues they may have a yellowish cast to them but because of this characteristic, our specimens are very sensitive to light and temperature. So we keep them in an amber t container and we don't want to leave them sit around before testing. Our Billy Rubin methodology, as I said, we measure total and we measure conjugated and then we calculate the unconjugated because that can be the significant portion. But for the most part, they're conjugated that we are being concerned with. Our methods began with Ehrlich's and there was an Evelyn Malloy modification but over time the Gen Drastic Groff method became our method of choice and that is the current method that we are using in the laboratory. The Gen Drastic Groff is a modified Ehrlich's diazole coupling, and you're going to hear that word a lot when we get to your analysis. Billy Rubin reacts with this diazotized sulfonylic acid in acetic background to form azobilirubin, which gives it a pinkish red color complex that we can measure. Direct bilirubin is water soluble, so it reacts with this. Total bilirubin, which involves both direct and indirect, this is needs an activator and caffeine is used that helps remove it from the albumin so it will bind being water soluble. Here's some uh, facts to help you separate the two. And conjugated is direct, it circulates in the uh, serum, serum and it's bound to albumin. It loses the albumin in order to cross the cell membranes. We add alcohol to our diazo to help this occur. Conjugated is old term of direct. It is goes through the liver hepatocyte and glucuronic acid is added and it goes to the bile duct for intestinal distribution. It does react with aqueous diazo. Jaundice is a pathological uh, hepatotic, hep hepatic condition and with the discoloring of the skin, even the um, sclera on the eyes or their mucous membranes if we have enough of it. It could be hepatic, obviously, if we have a problem in the liver, we're going to accumulate too much. But it could also be prehepatic, which might be overproduction of it. In the, in the case of the newborns, it is prehepatic and hepatic because the liver isn't um, mature enough. Or posthepatic, if we've got some kind of blockage like our bile duct or our gallbladder, we will start seeing some jaundice. A few disorders of Billy metabolism that we are concerned, these are usually younger patients. Gilbert's disease involves the uh, active transport of bilirubin through this hepatocyte and it's usually a mild condition. Kriegler nager is a decreased or complete lack of the enzyme to, to make this conjugation occur and it is fatal because you build up too much of the unconjugated. Dubin Johnson is a, a, another mild form of disease and it's um, removing the bilirubin for excretion. There's another one called rotor that involves intracellular binding of the protein. This graphic puts most of those together where you can see what is happening. Here we have our indirect or unconjugated bilirubin has to have action upon it to become able to go into the cell membrane. It has action upon it to change into direct and goes through, passes through the bile canicula and these are the areas where there's a problem. Ray's syndrome is usually precipitated by aspirin, excess use, 
years ago we were seeing more cases of this since we've gone to the acetaminophen for children we're not seeing as much of it it is an acute and usually fatal childhood syndrome that's caused by a virus um, and they'll, they start out as a upper respiratory tract infection they get a little better and then they suddenly get really sick again and they'll have vomiting and diarrhea and often they went on to coma and then had respiratory arrest it does affect the brain and the liver toxic hepatitis hepatitis is just inflammation of the liver Viral hepatitis is a worldwide disease. It is accompanied by hepatocellular inflammation and necrosis of these hepatocytes, and it can be caused by viruses, bacteria, parasites, drugs, chemicals, and toxins. Lots of things we're exposed to. And as you know from your immunology, um, so far we have five. There will probably be more letters coming up. And we're just going to refer to these a little bit. You already know plenty about it, so this is just a good review for you. This is what I want you to know in chemistry. Hepatitis A, acronym HAV, is from the oral fecal route, so it's usually contamination of water or food supplies. Could be in third world countries, but there's just a basic hygiene problem in the vicinity. It's a picovirus, single-stranded RNA virus with a short incubation period. Flu-like symptoms, kind of mild. And now that you have know this, every time you get the flu, you're going to think you have hepatitis A. It, it starts out with IgM, and so we will be able to measure IgM anti-HAV, which is the antibodies in serum during the acute stage. But as it persists, it converts to the IgG component, and it will appear within one or two months and persists. So we're able to measure that. Hepatitis B comes from blood or blood products, mainly through these routes. This is the one that all healthcare workers should have due to the potential of blood exposure from needle sticks or blood in general. This is the hepatitis B virus and it is a hepat DNA virus with a double shell called the Dane particle. We have the core and the envelope and the surface and we can measure different portions of this during different stages of the disease. Hepatitis surface antigen is the first antigen that we detect and that is in the the acute active phase. Then later we are able to detect the core and the envelope. And then once the surface antigen is gone we can find the surface antibodies. So we will eventually see antibodies for the core and the envelope. But the antibody anti-HBC is the most commonly detected and hopefully everyone in here has been vaccinated so yours would be positive. Hepatitis C, HCV, is the most common post-transfusion hepatitis. Um, people that get transfusion or infusion of a blood product are prone to acquire this and it is one of the most common risk factors and it will lead to cancer in the liver. Hepatitis D has been measured that long. It's called by an RNA, RNA virus, but it doesn't have a protein, so it can't reproduce, and it needs hepatitis B to help it. So the surface antigen on B 
helps hepatitis D proliferate. And this particular virus is a lot more uh, severe and does progress rapidly. Chronic hepatitis is where we've had inflammation in the liver for several months. This is not the acute phase. And you continue to have this inflammation in the hepatocytes. Your liver enzymes are going to start elevating. Do you remember which ones those are? And the most common cause is your B and C hepatitis virus. But some of our autoimmune diseases can bring this on. So not all jaundice people have the viruses. Cirrhosis of the liver. It's this chronic liver disease where the hepatocytes just aren't functioning anymore. And eventually all diseases can lead to cirrhosis. The biggest cause of cirrhosis is alcohol consumption over long periods of time. And we saw how the, the cells remove all of the contaminants and pull them out and they're not allowed, they can't function right so they don't remove all those. So you're going to start seeing all these toxins within your body system and you're going to start having some of these symptoms. You're going to have edema and fluid buildup in your peritoneum. The coag factors are reduced so you're going to have bruising. The skin will start to itch and tenderness to the liver. Alcoholic liver disease is um, specific with these risk factors. If you have these, then you're more likely to get this. It's a little more specific than just cirrhosis. It progresses with uh, fatty liver after a short period of time of continual consumption. It is, at that point, benign and reversible. But as time goes on, it is not uh, as you have longer consumption, then your liver function tests are going to start elevating your enzymes and then eventually your cirrhosis. And at that point, you have permanent scarring and it's not reversible. Some of our other liver function tests, remember the enzymes you just told me about, and um, we can measure some of those bilirubin breakdown products in the urine. And we measure clotting factor times and ammonias. Ammonia is toxic to the brain, encephalopathy, and it is elevated in advanced liver disease. Remember, it's not taking out waste. Your specimen needs to be handled carefully because it is actually a gas. It's volatile. It's unstable. You can easily contaminate it. Um, it continues to metabolize after you collect, so we usually draw an ETTA on ice. Getting the temperature down helps stop that, and as soon as we spin it down, we do separate the plasma and keep it refrigerated until testing. If you are in a lab that does ammonia, you will have to special treat it and probably keep a backup specimen in the refrigerator. You put it on the analyzer, it sits around for an hour, and then you get your results and find out it didn't work. You do need some specimen that's been preserved. The method of choice for ammonia involves glutamate hydrogenase. What is this? Yeah, it's an enzyme. And this shows how it's using um, NADPH and NADP.